Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about my favorite books that I read in 2020. So these don't didn't necessarily come out in 2020, some of them did. These are just the books from the books that I read in 2020, my top 10. We're gonna go in ascending order of greatness. <laughs> so we're gonna go from worst to best, but obviously these are all favorites. So none of them are bad. They're all great books in my opinion. The rankings are not really set. Like I had to come up with some kind of order. So some of them, I mean, I don't necessarily know for sure that I would, uh, they could be interchangeable. They're all my top 10. Really the only, the, the only one that's like for sure, for sure number one and is not interchangeable with anything else is my number one. So everything else like is like really solid and it was really tough to kind of rank them. So don't go by my ranking too much. <laughs> all right, so 10th best in my opinion. It was Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I can't decide if I like this better than Seven Husbands of Evil and Hugo. I might. Um, part of the charm of it is the audiobook, which is read by multiple narrators. So the what the story is about is about this fictional rock band that at the point, the peak of its success, supposedly, it broke up. And so now in the present day, supposedly, someone is interviewing all the members of this band and asking them, you know, how they came together and how they ultimately broke up. So it's actually an excellent format for a TV show or movie. And I do believe it is being adapted because it really needs to be. But the audiobook of it is almost like an adaptation of it because you've got different narrators being the voices of each of these band members being interviewed. So it has this kind of feeling of like a PBS special, which maybe that doesn't sound fun. I'm a nerd, so that sounds great. And it kind of reminded me a little bit of Almost Famous, the movie. It really feels like a real rock band. You're like, it's kind of hard to believe at times that this wasn't a real rock band. And when they talk about these iconic moments that everyone remembers and, you know, everybody knew that album cover and how everyone reacted to that. It's, it's really, really excellent. And it really feels real. And the characters, you really, they're not, all, they're definitely not likable characters or rock stars. So, but they're really compelling and the story is really engrossing. And, and I, oh, so I did like, I, I wept so hard reading Seven Husbands. I just teared up a little bit with this one. I don't know if that makes one better than the other, but like it, it, it was emotional, but not as emotional as Seven Husbands. Absolutely excellent and highly, highly recommend you experience it as an audiobook. My ninth best was Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. I, I think I would like to have put Royal Assassin on here, but I haven't finished that yet as of the filming of this video. I'm not confident that I will finish it before the end of 2020. So I do think Royal Assassin is better than the first book, the Assassin's Apprentice. However, again, because I haven't finished the other one, I couldn't put it on here. So really, Assassin's Apprentice is on, is on here as like a placeholder for Royal Assassin. Am I allowed to do that? Of course I am. It's my channel. I can do what the fuck I want. Um, so yeah, I've just been, I'm falling in love with Robin Hobb's writing and with the Farseer trilogy. And I absolutely see why people love Hobb so much. The first book is really charming and really cozy and absolutely the fantasy that I imagine I'm reading whenever I imagine myself curling up with a blanket and a cup of tea when it's dreary outside. Like, the Farseer trilogy is basically, it's its the thing that I always was imagining and didn't know I was imagining. It's such a cozy, engrossing, yet adventure-filled and heartbreak-filled and character-driven and excellent story that you just kind of melt into. And it's so good. My eighth best book is a recent read, and that is Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. I was kind of blown away by this book. I really feel like, oh, I should have mentioned this in the beginning of the video. Sorry, I just thought of it. I did not put any rereads on this list because I feel like that's, if not cheating, if I'm rereading a book, it's most likely because I love it. So I just didn't think it was fair, I guess, to put a reread on this list because is it the best 2020? It's really just a great book that I decided to re-experience in 2020. Anyway, so nothing on here will be a reread. Should have said that in the beginning. We're all caught up. So yeah, Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. I was kind of staggered by the character work she did because Alias Grace is actually based on a true story. I do have a full review on my channel for the book as well as a discussion of how it compares to the adaptation. So it's clear that Margaret Atwood did a lot of research into the real events that uh, inspired the story and about who Grace Marks was and about whether what there is known and what we could use to base our conclusions about whether or not she really did, if she really was complicit in the murder that she was imprisoned for. So I just, I think she did an excellent job of weaving fact with fiction and while keeping the reader more or less, keeping that line, I guess, fairly clear for the reader, uh, which parts she is fictionalizing, which parts are factual. And the, her portrayal of Grace Marks was so complex and so rich and so layered, intricate and 
kind of haunting and chilling at times, but also really feminist. And it was just a really amazing book that I feel like I'm going to come back to again and again and really pick apart. It's so good. Next on my list is Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. I was not expecting to like this as much as I did, even though I, I picked it up because I heard so many positive things about it from pretty much everyone that had read it. I picked it up because it was either for free or like 99 cents on Kindle in July, which was, you know, Independence Day month. I was like, yeah, that's a good one for now. <laughs> Is the season for zombies in the Civil War. I hate zombies really more than anything, more than any other kind of like supernatural spooky monster horror thing. So that's another reason I didn't really want to read it, but something about putting zombies in historical context makes it palatable to me. So I really like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and this kind of gave me the, it's t entirely different and it's a lot more serious about kind of thinking about how zombies would affect the historical landscape, but it kind of gave me those vibes, which to me is a positive thing. Um, I feel like Gallery did a really good job of sort of playing out the thought exercise of how zombies would have affected the Civil War, would have affected Civil War era society, how zombies would actually, like the mechanics and logistics and anatomy of the zombie and the main character, she's independent in a way that is also believable for her circumstances and time period. I hate anachronistically feminist characters where it feels like they're a 20th century character that was plucked off of like a Me Too march and just sent back to wear a corset. And I'm like, this just does not fit. It is not believable that a person would behave and think this way back then because you are affected by the environment that you're nurtured in and they just simply would not think this way no matter how independent thinking and feminist they are. They just, they wouldn't even have the vernacular for it. So I think she did a really good job giving us a feminist character that felt believable for this imagined time and circumstance. I really, really enjoyed it. I had hoped to read the sequel to it immediately thereafter. I didn't get around to it, but I do in definitely intend to read the sequel, which the name of escapes me. I do highly recommend Dread Nation, and I expect to love the second one. I've heard positive things about that as well. Next on my list is Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. I did not expect to love this book as much as I did. I and again, it's it's like horror type stuff, which is not really my jam usually. Yeah, I, I heard mainly positive things, but a few people criticize it before I picked it up. So I went into it sort of with tempered expectations and I was shocked by how much I loved it. In the first place, the style of Grady Hendrix prose is so easy to chew through. I found myself just flying through pages and pages and pages in no time. His writing style, something about it is just so digestible. So it goes down real smooth. Uh, the story itself, less smooth, <laughs> very graphic and horrific. So definitely check out content warnings if you're worried about that. It is very graphic, very like potentially triggering, depending on what your triggers are. Sexual assault, violence, child abuse, you know, physical harm, body horror, you name it, it's in there. But I think it is also charmingly, darkly comedic and feminist. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I felt myself raging at the frustrations that the women are feeling in this 90s kind of housewife setup where they are not taken seriously and where they are gaslit and I just oh I felt myself like oh, like absolutely raging but like in a good way because he was portraying it in a realistic believable and frustratingly so way where I was like oh I, uh, uh. so and I was kind of low-key shocked that a man wrote it because he really nailed it on the whole like feminist frustration and rage and I was like good job sir that is what it's like being a lady. Well done. So I yeah, absolutely recommend it as just like, it's a really good, you know, horror black comedy. And it's also really feminist and satisfying on that level as well. So it was just an A plus read. Next on my list is Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. This is a book that I intended to read when it came out and then just didn't get around to it. I finally did read it and oh boy, am I glad I did. It was so Oh, good. And I do highly recommend the audiobook. It's read by Trevor Noah. And since it's, it's a memoir of his experiences growing up in apartheid South Africa, it lends it that certain something extra to hear him tell it because it's his story. They're his memories. So it's not a narrator dramatizing it. It's basically like having Trevor in the room telling you about his life. So I, I recommend it. But yeah, basically I, it's, it wasn't anything, I'm a fan of Trevor Noah. So vaguely I was aware that he grew up in South Africa during apartheid. I knew that he was half black and half white. I would heard him use the phrase born a crime in his stand-up comedy because, you know, technically whites and blacks couldn't mix and breed <laughs> according to apartheid rules and law. So the, his very existence was not supposed to be, be allowed. So his existence was a crime. So I knew that. I just, there was just so much nuance and so many humorous and incredible and harrowing anecdotes that he had. And I I knew that his mother had to have been a pretty formidable woman to raise a, 
a son who was half white during apartheid. Just knowing that fact about her, I expected a very strong and independent and willful individual, but I just I had no concept of just how incredible a human being his mother is. And I say it still is, she's still alive. I had this incredible newfound respect for his mother um, and for him as well. I mean, what he went through is kind of, it's kind of crazy where he's able to ascend to considering his beginnings. It's quite a hero's journey, <laughs> except it's real life. But um, I feel like if somebody fictionalized a book like this, you'd be like, oh, that's so unbelievable. But the truth is often stranger than fiction. And he tells it in such a charming and nonchalant way that is just a joy to listen to, a joy to hear, a joy to experience, because he doesn't tell it in a way that feels like you're being lectured or you're being like it's a pity party. He's like expecting your sympathy. He tells it in a way where it's these are incredibly amusing anecdotes, the sad ones and the funny ones. You just want to hear more. Um, and I was so upset. The book is actually fairly short. And I was surprised and upset when it ended. I was like, no, I want more, please. The book is an absolute treat. Next up, I have The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. This is a book that I had, I had intended to read for a very long time. And I finally, finally picked it up. And I had been putting it off for so long because no, even though I'd heard it was fantastic and I expected it to be fantastic, I kept hearing from everybody that it was so hard to read, that it just is, it's a chore to get into because of the second person style narration. And so it always just seemed like a huge commitment and a really massive project to actually pick it up and read it. And it always sounded like too much effort, but I did finally pick it up. And I did not find the writing style at all to be difficult to get into. I started reading it because I grabbed a bunch of books on my shelf and was gonna try a chapter until of each until I found one that I was like vibing with. And it was the first one that I picked up and I immediately vibed with it. <laughs> I feel like her writing style is really easy to sink into and really compelling and really visceral. And it's, it's sort of this bare bones style that is really, really, powerful. I don't really know how else to say it. It just, it's because it's so bare bones, it, it almost feels like it lacks cushioning and is, there's no, the, the, the blows are full force for that reason. Um, she, it's a really dark and feminist and harrowing portrait that she paints of I believe a future earth because it's sort of science fiction fantasy. So there's magic, I guess, although the way that it's told, it's, it's is it magic? <laughs> is it, is it science? Is it, what is it? Is it evolution? The way, the nature of the storytelling, I did not find to be an ordeal at all. The story itself is kind of an ordeal because again, the, it is a harrowing landscape and the characters' experiences are intense. And I would warn people picking it up for triggers because there is sexual assault, there is child murder, there is, I mean, there's a lot of dark things in it. So it is by no means a light read, but I do think it's an easy read insofar as my ability to like get through it. I feel like her writing style is compelling and it keeps you reading and keeps you engaged and is immediately engrossing for me anyway. And it's one of the most original things that I've ever read. It's so entirely unique that I'm absolutely gobsmacked by it. <laughs> and I wish people hadn't sort of scared me off of it. I wish I'd read it sooner. Although I guess, I mean, I've read it now, so it doesn't matter that I didn't read it sooner, but I do feel like it does it a disservice the way people discuss it as being so difficult. It's, it's really not. <laughs> I'd say pick it up. It's not hard to read. <laughs> The next book on my list is Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates. This is another book that is easy to read and hard, hard, hard to get through. This is a really short book and it is a sort of memoir style narrative that is framed as a letter from Ta-Nehisi Coates to his son where in which he's sort of describing the, the trials of being a black man in America as a sort of cautionary tale to help prepare his son for the world that he'll face as a black man in America. And it is somewhat hopeful, uh, the suggestion that Perhaps these things will not affect his son because one, to be forewarned is forearmed, but also that the world is changing, hopefully for the better. However, again, the way Ta-Nehisi Coates writes it, it doesn't sound especially hopeful about the world changing because changing the way humans behave is more difficult than a few PSAs. <laughs> the way he tells it is beautiful and compelling. And for that reason, it's easy to read because Ta-Nehisi Coates' prose is really excellent. It's easy to sink into, it's easy to get into the flow of it. He tells it well. I found myself devouring it page after page after page. However, the content is again, harrowing. So for that reason, it's not an easy read because it is heartbreaking to read what he's experienced. And I did, there was a moment where I sort of like get let out this guttural sob because the way he tells it is kind of, it's entirely different, the style of the prose from N.K. Jemisin, but similarly, my reaction to it was sort of this visceral, like, it doesn't pull its punches. There's nothing to cushion the blow. There's no artful 
poetry to kind of make it all kind of beautifully sad. It's just hardcore, just like hits you, like punch to the throat sad. And I just like for a second couldn't deal with it. I absolutely recommend it. It is blurb by Toni Morrison. The blurb says this is required reading. I absolutely agree that it is. I think it honestly should be required reading in school in America at the very least. It, 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 absolutely, it's, it's really short. So there's honestly no excuse. Just fucking read it. All right, we're down to my top two. <laughs> Well, second best book of the year was Dark Age by Pierce Brown, which I had been intending to read since it came out. However, I was determined to finish my reread of the Red Rising books, uh, all the Red Rising books before picking up Dark Age so that it'd all be fresh in my brain. My reread took a little longer than expected, but I did complete my reread and then I did finally pick up Dark Age. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, Dark Age is a hell of a ride. I keep saying that Pierce Brown's writing keeps getting better and better. I thought that Iron Gold was his best writing to date. And now Dark Age has dethroned Iron Gold and it is better than Iron Gold. It's, uh, people, fellow fans, fellow howlers had prepared me for the quintessentially Pierce Brown punch to the gut in terms of, you know, character deaths and tragic moments or whatever. So I, I was expecting to have my heart ripped out that characters would probably die or get horribly injured or tragic things would happen to part them or whatever. I was expecting that. <laughs> I went in emotionally prepared and armored for that. What I did not expect and no one had prepared me for was how banana cuckoo bonkers like crazy Dark Age is. He was introducing things to the narrative and to the world that I didn't know was an option. <laughs> it was just completely insane. And it wasn't insane where I was just like, well, that's just ridiculous. And I can't even take this seriously anymore. Like I was still taking it seriously, but it was so bizarre that I was, <laughs> I like didn't know how to react to it. I was like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> So that I was not prepared for. Um, talk about changing the paradigm, which is Pierce Brown's favorite expression. It's a wowza. I, yep, game changer. Massive, massive game changer. Again, did not know half the things in that book were an option. It's just insane. <laughs> Good insane, compelling insane, dark as fuck insane. It was a, a, a nuts book that I, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I highly recommend it, but Jesus fucking Christ. <sighs> And now for my favorite book of the year, which should come as no surprise to people who have followed me for a while, The Trouble with Peace by Joe Abercrombie. I mean, it's Joe Abercrombie. It's the first law. It's the age of madness. I already said in my review that The Trouble with Peace dethroned a little hatred, and a little hatred had dethroned Bester of Cold as my favorite book in the first law universe. It is the best one in the first law so far. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. It's amazing. It's, I just, I mean, I have a full non-spoiler review and a spoilery gush on my channel. So check those out if you're interested in my full lengthy gushy thoughts. It's, it's, that's also, it's really hard to talk about because it's the second book in a series that is a sequel series to like his other series in this universe. So like, it's really hard to talk about it in any way that makes sense to anybody that hasn't read it. All I have to, all I can really say is that Abercrombie's already in incredibly amazing character work that he's brought to the table throughout his books keeps getting better. Like I didn't think it could get better, but it does get better. The ways that he interweaves plots is more intricate and more surprising. And it's, ah, ah, it's so good. I just, I don't, mm, mm. It's really hard to be articulate about something that I love so much. I fucking love it cannot wait for the third book in the age of madness i am i'm prepared to be blown away and i'm prepared now now i'm now i'm expecting the third book to be even better so the bar is quite high sir and i expect you to to exceed my expectations yep so that does it for my top 10 books of 2020 let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of the books that are in my top 10 if you agree with me that they are fantastic or you hated them whatever you want to let me know i post videos on saturdays other random times as well but definitely saturdays so like and subscribe see you when i see you